important audience, our cherished and seasoned panel of CEOs, comprising of Mr. Suresh Narayanan, Chairman and Managing Director, Nestle India, Mr. Rajan Anandan, Managing Director, Surge and Sequoia Capital India, Ms. Daisy Chitala Pillay, President, Cisco India and Sark, and Mr. B. Ambrish Rao, who is the CEO, Pine Labs. Though our panelists are most popular leaders, but in case anyone wants to view their complete profile, you can find it on our PAFI website. The panel will deliberate on one of the most sought after agenda of today's time that's reviving the economy. So eagerly looking forward towards this discussion. I'd also like to welcome our moderator for the session, Mr. Rohit Saran, editor in chief, Times of India Digital, and Mr. Raman Sidhu, who's the past president and founding member of PAFI and CEO EBG Federation for his closing remarks. I have one request for the audience as well, please. Send your questions in Q&A box, which will be accessed by our moderator for further discussions. I would now invite Mr. Rohit Saran to take over, please, and would request him to keep an eye on his watch as we are running back-to-back -back sessions. Over to you, Rohit, please. Thank you very much, Anbuti. And as I said, we have, I'm so both humbled and happy to be part of it. Humbled because uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to do the best of the very powerful panel that I have uh, in the time. And, and I think the only impolite part of my job, which probably I will not have to do, is to remind, uh, uh, just to keep the time. But uh, my panelists are very seasoned, probably that won't be required. Um, I think when we look at the at, at the at the topic of uh, this session, which is I think reviving the economy, um, I, it, I think it's clear that from the time uh, Pafi decided the title of this session to now, lots has changed, and seems like lots have changed for the better. Uh, and and you know, as any of you uh, who's part of the audience of the panel, no news, uh, at least in the short and medium term news on the economy seems to be bad news. We are only hearing good news to great news. Uh, there, of course, uh, you know, I mean, yesterday, Neil Kant Mishra wrote, Cred Suisse wrote a, a lead piece on the edit page of Time Sunday where he said that that we have probably in most sectors, we have gone beyond the pre-COVID levels. And 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 he's, he's, he's predicting that growth will be higher than what RBI and most of the forecasters are predicting. Yesterday was a part of a Raghuram Rajan and Arvind Subramaniam session. Um, and there also they were putting series of slides to show how strong the short term growth are. they had some deep worries about the longer term things but that if we time allows will come but we don't have to and and i think today morning i saw a crystal report on coal uh, supplies in india which coal coal shortages and power has has taken many of our new space of it and it shows that i thought one thing that struck out as on all the uh, heavy industry states of uh, india maharashtra gujarat uh, 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 are going to see something like 25 to 30 percent growth in coal demand this year. So just I thought it's an interesting leading indicator of the kind of rebound we are seeing. So, so if I could come, uh, Suresh, to you first, Swan, because I think I, I mean you you represent such a wide swath of economy, going from the deepest, the widest, uh, you know, of 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 India's rural economy to all the way to the highest end of the urban consumption. Um, and I also noted that you you've you've been a student of economics, uh, uh, so macroeconomy probably is still remains your love. Uh, so these were two. So I mean, if you can just give us your sense in three four minutes. But there are three things. If I I would request you to so do you think that it's no more a question of revival, but more a question of how strong is the rebound and how sustainable is the rebound? I mean, there is clearly a revival, but is it sustainable? Um, if it is a strong rebound, do you see that companies like yours and others uh, will soon see a big jump in investment because private investment is still a worry? And lastly, uh, do you think that there is uh, some sort of a post pandemic customer um, that is different from pre pandemic customer? If these three things you could tap on, they'll be really great. Yes, Rish, um, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you, Rohit. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And yes, my good friend Ajay Khanna has been after me to be at a Pafi panel, and I'm very, very happy that I'm able to make it, uh, make it today. Uh, I want to to state upfront, uh, Rohit, unashamedly, and with a great amount of pride, uh, that I am a person with a great belief, a great faith, and a great bullishness on the consumption sector of the Indian economy. Let's let's be very, very clear. 
the economy is driven in India by consumption, consumption of all kinds. Uh, I sit in one of the spheres of consumption, which is the food processing uh, industry, and I can tell you that uh, uh, that consumption once it gets revived fully, and there are a few things that that will probably happen for it. Uh, I don't think that the economy needs to to look back, or indeed. Uh, we will probably come out of this uh, stronger. Uh, I'll take your first, uh, your, your last question first. You talked about the consumer. Uh, I think the consumer has undergone a fair bit of change uh, as, a, as a result of the pandemic. And there are three or four changes that have taken place. Number one, the consumer today is looking at tried and tested brands and not necessarily looking at enormous amount of experimentation, at least in the field in which I am in. In the, in, the, in the consumer goods space, in the food space, tried and trusted brands is what the consumer is looking at because you don't want to experiment uh, with stuff that you don't really know about. Number two, quality and nutrition is at a premium. The consumer says, I want to have products that have got quality and nutrition, and I'm willing to pay for that quality and nutrition. So that's music to the ears of companies like Nestle because after a long, long time, we come into a sphere where consumers are saying that quality, nutrition, and trust go together. Number three, there is one element which has entered our lexicon, which, which never was there in our dictionary, the word immunity. Uh, we were talking about immunity from, from, from taxes and immunity from, uh, from, uh, from regulatory uh, um, uh, upsurge, uh, mm. upsurgence and various other things, but we never talked about health immunity as being a key characteristic. Today, immunity is becoming a big, uh, big feature. And fourth is value seeking. I think one of the things is in the economic context of the country where, uh, where unemployment uh, has been rampant, where the economy is, is coming back in fits and starts in terms of rebounding back on employment and jobs have been lost, salaries have been cut. Uh, I think there has been a fair amount of, uh, of, of, of impact uh, because of that, that is uh, that is taking place, and that indeed uh, does have value seeking as becoming an important proposition uh, that consumers are looking at. So this is where this is where the consumer is. Mm -hmm. If you look at consumption, uh, I think for for, so for companies. Uh, Suresh, you're talking about the customer has definitely changed, and you, you had told us uh, some of the ways the customer has changed. And, and we were going to come to whether this rebound is sustainable and whether you think that there will soon be a, 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 a substantial uptick in private investment, which seems to still be nowhere near where it used to be. Look, I think, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, two things I believe uh, will, will, will probably uh, pave the way ahead. A lot of the consumption return uh, will depend very clearly on uh, the level of uh, employment and the kind of uh, confidence that gets built in the economy. I think the word confidence mm -hmm. uh, has now become an extremely important word uh, in our dictionary because this is going to define uh, whether we see the, the economic growth that we see today as uh, a rebound, is it sustainable, you know, there are still debates on is it a V-shaped recovery, is it a K-shaped recovery, you know, different letters of the alphabet are now getting used. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I think uh, I think a lot will depend on the return of employment, mm -hmm. sustainable employment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the tech sector is booming. One, one is talking about youngsters going with five offers in their in their pocket, <laughs> but there are other sectors. So while Daisy will be will be having a struggle to get the get the talent to stick. Mm -hmm. There are some other sectors where uh, you know there are people are applying, but uh, there are no jobs. So I think mm -hmm. this will this will be an important uh, feature. I can only say that uh, I think those companies and I, I count my company in that in that category, uh, where uh, where our demand has been relatively strong. Uh, in fact, we have announced an investment of about 26 billion, about 2,600 crores, mm -hmm. uh, which is fairly substantial for a consumer uh, industry mm -hmm. uh, into the um, uh, into new investments. And in fact, our uh, I'm very happy that our ninth factory, which is a baby of the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, has just been born. I mean, uh, the factory in Sanan mm -hmm. in Gujarat, which was completely executed during the pandemic, has now uh, started and. Uh, uh, it is 65% uh, uh, women uh, 
uh, operators in that factory. So I really want the factory to also set the standards on digital. It is a paperless factory. It is the most sustainable factory, zero carbon, carbon emission. And also 65% uh, of the workforce are women, which is new in manufacturing. It's, mm -hmm. it's not new in many, mm -hmm. uh, many sectors, mm -hmm. but in manufacturing, it's a relatively new part. So I think, I think there are a lot of positives that are going. What I, what I believe would stop us in our tracks is what we were, what we were alluding to, levels of inequality. Right. I think inequality and uh, a disproportionate share of resources being available to particular sectors. And the second one is the bounce back of the MSMEs. Right. You know, right. Let's, right. let's not forget that the MSME is really at the at the center of our economy. Mm -hmm. And while we are all uh, uh, very happy with the booming stock market, which mm -hmm. captures 100, 200 companies, maybe uh, there is an unorganized sector that we still need to watch mm -hmm. and see whether it comes back strongly. So let me let me stop there. So that others can also express their views. Thank you very much, uh, Suresh. And we would definitely like to come back to you, even if very briefly, for a couple of things. Um, Rajan, if I can come to you, a uh, couple of things. You, I mean, you probably this panel have the deepest and widest view of the tech, which I think in today's economy means probably having view of everything because tech is permeating everything. Um, two things that if in your uh, if in your opening remark you can address uh, apart from anything else. One is that I heard something like close to. 30 billion worth of uh, VC money and, and, and seed money has come into India already this year and all records are going to be broken in terms of how much venture capital has come into India and, and part of it is we are seeing in, in almost every day new unicorn, unicorns getting created. So I, was, I had the two things which relate to macro. Do you think that so much of money that's coming in from abroad into these new businesses in India? Are these investors seeing a new India in terms of everything, in terms of not just entrepreneurial energy, but ability to service Indian and global markets out of India in terms of ability to create products that can be both Indian and global in nature? Is the world seeing a new India in that sense? And number two, entrepreneurship is mostly about ideas and solutions. Um, so are, are you seeing a significantly better ideas and approach of solving things um, than you saw maybe even two years ago. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rohit, uh, for moderating and uh, uh, it's great to great to be here. So as you so for, I think, firstly, uh, as you said, uh, this is uh, sort of an extraordinary year for the Indian startup ecosystem. Uh, just in the last quarter, right, which uh, the quarter that ended in September, uh, mm -hmm. we got over $10 billion, $10.9 billion of startup funding. Uh, which is the exact amount that we got for all of 2020. And if you look at the first three quarters, the calendar quarters of 2021, so January through end of September, uh, we had close to $25 billion of venture capital funding. And the highest, uh, uh, the year with the highest amount of funding prior to this was 2019, uh, where we had about $14 billion. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's very clear we are two weeks into October. Uh, we've got another two and a half months to go. So India will get if not close, if not at very close to $30 billion of, uh, of startup funding in 2021, which is basically 2x of, mm. of, of the you know, year that was highest before this, which is 2019. So clearly something is happening. No, I think the, now in terms of what's driving this, uh, first thing to keep in mind is, you know, the, glo the world is awash uh, mm. in liquidity, right? Uh, and um, uh, and, and that, that, that's pretty important. And people should keep in mind that as the liquidity uh, scenario change changes and that will change by the way we know this uh these mm -hmm. cycles come and go uh you will see a pullback from all startup funding not just india but all across the world so mm -hmm. that's what uh you know unprecedented amounts of liquidity around the world i think the second look with with covid uh you know at the at the beginning of the lockdowns around the world uh you know i think all of us all investors were very worried all founders were very worried but i think what we've learned over the last uh, you know call it 15 18 months is that covid has been a massive accelerator of adoption of, of software, right? Uh, be, it, be it consumer internet, be it digital health, be it ed tech, be it fintech, uh, be it from consumers or be it from small businesses, right? And, and I think that has created um, even more excitement about what could happen uh, with startups over a long period of time in terms of revenue, profits, and so on and so forth. So those two things combined, uh, you know, it's, it's not just India, by the way, right? China, you know, it's an interesting statistic uh, because you know, as as we've been reading over the last couple of months, China has taken some very, uh, you know, very very um, unexpected sort of regulatory moves, right? On mm -hmm. ed tech, 
uh, mm. in, in, in fintech and so on and so forth, and now it's social media. But despite all these changes, uh, first nine months uh, of startup funding in China is equal to all of last year. And last Whoa. year was a record high for China, right? So, <laughs> you know, so, so and, and, and the US is sort of off the charts, right? It's getting close to $200 billion of uh, startup funding this year. So it's not just an India story, and I think we need to uh, keep that in mind. Now, specifically coming to India, um, look, I mean, there's three things that are happening, right? One, obviously, there's a massive amount of capital, uh, mm. uh, right? Um, but but if you set that aside, I think the things that are happening, one, the biggest question about the Indian startup ecosystem for at least the last five, seven, eight years has been where are the exits, right? Uh, you know, everybody kept going back to uh, the Flipkart acquisition by Walmart and, you know, maybe some secondaries, like, for instance, with Oyo. Uh, mm. But really, we haven't had material exits. But this year, uh, you know, just within the Sequoia Capital India portfolio, right, the firm mm -hmm. that, uh, that I'm with, uh, you know, we've had seven IPOs, uh, wow. which is sort of crazy, right? So, uh, and then if you look at large scale IPOs, uh, mm -hmm. the two notable IPOs over the last three months, Freshworks went, went, went public uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, right, at north of $10 billion market cap. And this is, uh, you know, software as a service, building software products from India to the world has been a big theme. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is the first of many IPOs, right? So we'll see next year, we'll see at least four or five very significant mm -hmm. IPOs on NASDAQ of, of these kind of companies, right? SaaS companies from India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other big notable one was in the domestic exchange, uh, which mm -hmm. is Zomato at, you know, $14, $15 billion mm -hmm. uh, is, is a very significant one. But those are only two, right? They've been quite a number. And I think we've seen. So I think I think the this this big question around where are the exits in India is beginning to get addressed. We still have a long way to go to mm -hmm. get where China is or where the US startup ecosystem is. But I do think uh, we're beginning to see exits and especially, you know, the best kind of exit for a startup is to go public, right? Because that's when uh, that's that's when you become an enduring company and you can go build for the next 10, 20, 30 years continue mm -hmm. in public market. So that's one. I think second, look, we've seen across sectors uh, the, 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 the addressable markets for tech startups getting deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. And and that the, and that 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 is that was slowly increasing year on year, but I think over the last eighteen months since the onset of COVID, in, especially in sub segments, some segments that has accelerated, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've you, you know you've you've heard of Baiju's talk about you know Baiju's now is at ten thousand crores of revenue. I mean that's a massive scale, you know, ten thousand yes. crores of revenue, right? Yes. Uh, that's yes. an tech company, right? And 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 it's not just Baiju's. I mean if you add up the next three or four companies, you're looking at thousands of crores of revenue, and this is by the way very high gross margin, positive unit economics, pat positive revenue, right? It's mm -hmm. the kind of business that, you know, Suresh, for instance, would understand, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's large revenue, it's high gross margin, and it's pat positive for that matter, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for that matter, Daisy would understand, right? Uh, yes. which, which are massively <laughs> profitable companies. Uh, and mm -hmm. you, you go across segments. So, so, so markets are getting deeper. We are still a long way to go uh, mm -hmm. because as I keep reminding my teams, India is still at $2,000 per capita. Okay, most of India is very, very poor. And the last, you know, 18 months, we've been set back pretty dramatically, especially for a large segment of the population. But that despite said, look, 100 million or 200 million users who have meaningful disposable income is actually a pretty large segment. And they are, they are going to digital faster than anything we've ever seen. So that's number two. I think the third thing that's very important is the quality of our entrepreneurs mm. uh, is, is improving by leaps and bounds every year, right? And what we are seeing now is you know, you know, almost, you know, and we are very, very active across stages, you know, seed stage, venture stage, growth stage, but at the seed stage where we make the largest number of investments, you know, you know, 70 to 80% of the founders that we invest in um, either come, uh, either are repeat founders, this is not their first mm -hmm. role, this is their second or third company, or they actually come from what I call academy companies, right? They have grown up in mm -hmm. hyperscale companies and many of them being sort of the the flip cards the the olas the fresh works um mm. you, so they've sort of they, they, they've seen sort of what it takes to build great products what it takes to grow fast what it takes to hire teams what it takes to raise funding and all of that right and and that's a very very important thing so for instance you know if you look at SaaS companies that have been starting up today right they're mm. able to get to a million dollars of revenue within a year right which mm. you could have could have never imagined a few years ago right because you know it would take three four four years to get to a million so, so i think that's the that's the that's the other big factor so i'd say it's those three things uh rohit that have uh, uh that have that have changed uh you mm -hmm. know in the indian startup ecosystem now all this being said look we are still very much uh at ground zero and the reason i say that is because our gdp per capita is two thousand dollars okay mm -hmm. if you look at china's uh, startup ecosystem it really started getting into high gear 
when they crossed four thousand dollars per capita. Two thousand and nine. Uh, China crossed four thousand dollars per capita. Alibaba's GMB went up fifty billion dollars that year, mm -hmm. right? So, so in many ways, we are still five to ten years away from prime time. So, for those those folks who think so the startup mm -hmm. ecosystem is booming today, well, actually, we're not even started yet. So, so, so I think the best is yet to come. Now, to your last question uh, on on on, are we seeing innovative uh, new models? The answer is absolutely yes. I'll take two companies uh, which are sort of in our surge. You know, surge is our seed stage program in Sequoia. Yes. Um, yes. As examples, right? One is a company in our current cohort. It's called Absolute Foods. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolute Foods basically uses precision farming uh, to improve farm yields by 20 to 30 uh, percent for Indian farmers in the fruits and vegetables sort of uh, space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Now you can imagine what a company like this could do to Indian agriculture, right? Um, huge, huge. In a sense, globally, there's about 180 billion dollars worth of fruits and vegetables exports. India mm -hmm. has one percent share. In mm -hmm. the global fruits and vegetables value chain, and the reason is because uh, our fruits and vegetables are low quality and inconsistent. Now, mm -hmm. with, with absolute technology, farmers who use absolute technology are able to produce very high quality fruits and vegetables that mm -hmm. is extremely consistent, right? So, as a result, this is a company that you know is going to have billions of dollars of exports mm -hmm. because of, because of the technology that they can provide. Mm -hmm. so, so, here's a company that is basically transforming in many ways the most important sector that we have as a nation, which is agriculture, right? Another example is, is a company, is a deep tech company that's in our second cohort. It's a company called Log9, right? So Log9 basically uh, makes, uh, uh, you know, it's in the EV space, electric vehicle space, and they make batteries, right? So their vision, uh, Rohit, is to basically make fuel cells using aluminum, okay? Now, if you look at the electric vehicle space globally, uh, mm. We are all dependent on China for raw materials, right? Because mm -hmm. all fuel cells depend on raw materials coming from China. Now, mm. you know, if these this company is successful, uh, and you know the early signs are very very strong, um, you know, we India can actually be self sufficient when it comes to fuel cells, and that means ah. we can be completely self sufficient in electric vehicles, right? And ah. and so so and this is very very deep. There's only one other company in the world like this. Is a company in Israel, and Log9 is you know much further ahead than. Uh, that mm. company, right? So these are just two examples, Rohit, of the kind of innovation that we're seeing. You know, mm. we genuinely believe that, and I can give you, you know, dozens more, right? Uh, that we genuinely believe India, India is going to develop, you know, net new, fundamentally new to the world ideas, right? Mm. That will be massively disruptive uh, mm. and massively accretive to the Indian economy, but in many ways are, are, are going to be you know, Nandan talks about population scale ideas, right? UPI is a population scale idea. Aadhaar is a population scale idea. Actually, what we are really focusing on now is, you know, planetary scale ideas from India, right? So Log9 is a planetary scale idea. Absolute mm -hmm. foods can impact 3 billion people around the world. It's a planetary scale idea, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's sort of what we are. But we are still a ways from, by the way, where Elon Musk is, which is interplanetary <laughs> ideas. I think, uh, you know, we can, wait, we can wait a little bit for that. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, thanks so much, Rajan. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it is, this is, for the longest time, the startup ecosystem was thought, okay, a lot of good happens there, but it doesn't matter to the macro economy. But what you've said is that I think we are, we are at a stage where, where, where it will start uh, showing and it's agriculture and fuel cell. Those are fundamental wheels of uh, today's economy. And, 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 and I think there's absolutely no doubt that 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 we will see that stronger visible connect between the this thing. I will just come back to you. I'll just quickly go to my other panelist. Um, Daisy, I would come to you. Amrish, I'm keeping you uh, for after Daisy. I know you have been the most quiet panelist, but I'll just come to you. Just give me some time. If I can. Uh, Daisy, I was looking at your customer profile and, and the list of customers. They are like who's who of Indian industry across sectors, across geography, across size. Um, so I was thinking in 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 short, if you can just tell us a couple of things. One is that uh, how are your customers doing today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a year ago or so? And 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 do you think that which which uh, in a way both Suresh and, and um, alluded to and, and Rajan also talked about this MSME side, which which we share that unless there is an MSME bounce back, you really uh, will not see. So is there an MSME segment which you think is 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 how is it doing? And and are the tech understanding and requirement of your customers do you see having fundamentally changed after COVID? So the answer is yeah. yes, Rohit. I'll I'll start from from the last thing you asked. I think it's it's quite amazing that somewhere midway through the last eighteen months we started. I started getting requests as Cisco directly, also as part of the forums I was part of. CXOs mm -hmm. 
CEOs, board members who never wanted to talk about technology or who didn't understand cyber with a, you know, outside of that, wanted to really get into level one, level two, level three detailing, IoT, automation, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, digital, what does it mean to my business? It's still going on, right? So it's still mm -hmm. going on. So this reimagination of the way that businesses work across all sizes of businesses, I think that is still going on. And that I think is an incredibly important thing to have happened. It's good that COVID fast, I mean, if there's anything good that happened from COVID, probably it's that acceleration of that thought process. Mm -hmm. The Digital mm -hmm. India report, which McKinsey put out, uh, which mm -hmm. obviously all of us have seen it, uh, talks about two and a half trillion dollars of value creation from some 40 areas, but mm -hmm. primarily driven on the back of a lot of technology intervention, a lot of digital intervention. Uh, mm -hmm. But still, COVID happened. That report, I mean, let's let's own it. It was more or less a, a, an academic exercise. Some companies were pioneers, but most others were watching what's going to happen. COVID mm -hmm. did change that, right? COVID mm -hmm. did change that and uh, materially changed that. So mm -hmm. I think uh, to the, the point about our customers going to be very different, yes, they are. Uh, do they care? What do they care about most? I think, uh, again, Suresh talked about some of the conversations around experience a focus a true focus on the consumer whoever that consumer may be and the experience of that consumer and how can that experience be delivered digitally of course now but in the mm. long term digitally which means the ideal seamless interaction between physical channels and digital channels so that's that's the reimagination that's happening because we went from physical to largely digital and now we have to rethink for the future which is which is sort of a seamless blending of both. Mm -hmm. And to see it happening, even the most, and the best example of it is traditional companies like, uh, I, I will not call Nestle a traditional company, sure. but a lot of the traditional manufacturing companies are going digital in a very big way. But at mm -hmm. the same time, companies that Rajun like to fund, uh, like Baiju's are also coming into mm -hmm. the physical world by buying Akash, right? So there's this Akash. understanding that digital is the future. And so yes. you will have to have consumer experience which transcends both these physical and digital channels. So I think that's the number one shift that has happened. So for those of us in the tech industry, I think it's been um, it's been incredible to be a part of this conversation and continue to be a part of this conversation. Two or three things: uh, is it all pervasive? The answer is no. You mm -hmm. talked about the divide, so I do want to talk about. And yes, there are three. You know. Uh, we talk about whether it's a u-shaped recovery or a v-shaped recovery or a w-shaped recovery it's yeah uh, whatever other that there is there are some unequal pockets in india right so so the mm -hmm. brilliant news the most positive signals are coming from the deep tech startups uh, and the app startups that uh, you know rajan was talking about this year we've had three unicorns being birthed every month which is quite incredible mm -hmm. and we have 60 plus unicorns, we have more than 70 plus, which will become unicorn in the next two to four years. And CNN mm. is already talking about that becoming a trillion dollar economy out of India in the next few years, you know? So mm -hmm. the tech mm. industry is essentially talking about when we put all the things together, people, money, and a good idea together, and you embrace digital, and you embrace the demographic dividend of India, what can happen? Mm. And then mm. you, you know, and that can scale everywhere in the world. But at the same time, uh, there are spaces which are consumption led, like tourism, like hospitality, mm. like retail, uh, mm. where there are still pockets of struggles. SMB in particular, I mean, uh, is a space where yes. that the survival for the future, I mean, a lot of them have will reinvent themselves post COVID. Those of, I mm. mean, many have shut down and they will reappear in new, new avatars, and the others have gone through near death experiences and are looking to digitize. Uh, and using looking to technology for a way to survive the next disruption that will happen because you know that mm. is not a if it is only a question of when it will be COVID or something else. So you do see among the SMBs also uh, this realization that embracing technology and embracing going digital is necessary to uh, survive and thrive. So uh, I think across the spectrum of Excellent. players, big and small, you see this conversation. I think. Two or three things which are still to be thought of because we're talking about reviving Indian and Indian economy as, mm. as the topic. Mm. Mm. Two or three things I think Suresh talked about employment. Yes, in the tech mm. industry we have an attrition glut and we have lots of uh, uh, you know lots of uh, work and we are, we can't find people. But broadly, if you look at it, 
uh, we have a necessity to create anywhere from 60 to 90 million jobs with the 60 million youth, 30 million Absolutely. moving out of farming because precision farming and others will come in. So 30 million jobs which will move from being farm to non-farm jobs. And then on top of that, you add India's uh, bridging divide on gender parity, which means about 55 mm -hmm. million people will join Huge. the world. So yes. we need to create about 110 million jobs in the next 10 years or so. And we mm. haven't done that. So this is not a post-COVID issue, right? This is, I mean, mm. so we talked about this was COVID during COVID, but this flat yeah. employment problem was also for us a pre-COVID problem. Mm. So, you know, so I think we have to think about ways to do that. And the reason I, I called out the employment situation is the world needs 9x the number, amount of skills, digital skills that we have today. And India has always had a pole position of being an IT skills capital of the world. We now mm. have to find a way of how to become the digital skills capital of the world. And mm. therefore, you know, the 60 million youth, the 30 million folks who will grade from being becoming level one knowledge workers mm. and the 55 million women who are enabled by hybrid work, which is also a revolution that COVID has made possible. The largest POC in the world in hybrid work has happened. Uh, so, you know, all of this, if we can match that talent pool and that people pool to where the skills gap in the world is, that mm. would give us reboot as the digital capital of the of the world from the IT capital that we are. And we're doing very well there, right? We're doing very right. well, 150 billion industry uh, this year, potentially we'll grow to that. We could build the next phase of our journey in that space powered by tech and powered by digital. So of course there, uh, Yeah. No, no, thanks, Daisy. And we'll come back. You know, you, this this skill gap. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of companies who are doing it, and I think Rajan would know, Suresh will also know the upgrade and all that. But even there, there's lots happening at the top level or middle to top level. Rather than, I mean, we have things like e Gurukul and others who are doing at the bottom, but nowhere at the scale that you're talking about. And and as you very rightly talked about, I mean, uh, women participation in the workforce had dramatically fallen. It has to rise back, and how much that. Will and you can't get that unless you have a quality job. So, so yeah, thanks, Daisy. We will uh, come back to you for something about regulation. I, 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 uh, Amrish, I'll come to you. Sorry, you've been the quietest and I, the last to come, but you are, I think you are in the hottest possible sector of the economy where, you know, fintech, where finance and technology intersect and so much is happening. Uh, you know, you look at the charts of, of, of UPA, UPI transactions and you look at, uh, all the tech companies in the finance looks like, you know, even sky is not the limit. So, uh, so uh, I mean, two things uh, I wanted to just draw your attention. So one is that you see such dramatic growth in, in, in digital payments, uh, and yet then you see that cash payments are not falling. So is it that the volume is growing so much that cash will continue to grow and digital will continue to grow? What's happening there? Maybe a little bit of an innocent question, but if you had something to say, because it has a macroeconomic implication. Second was that in this journey, um, are we facing regulatory hurdles? Is, is FinTech facing whether it's from RBI side or legislation side? Um, you know, you keep hearing as a customer, okay, now you can't, you will have to give monthly approval for this deduction maybe, and you know, whatever. So these two things about, uh, about cash and digital coexisting and rising at the same time, and is FinTech facing regulatory and legislative hurdles? Uh, Amrish, if you could just throw some light on. So, you know, uh, the relationship of an entrepreneur with the regulator is always kabhi khushi kabhi gum. So, you know, right now, uh, what we have seen with uh, RBI about uh, standing instructions definitely impacting businesses, definitely impacting how consumers pay and how business models are operating. Having said that, I would be the first one to say that the Indian regulator has been the most forward looking regulator. And over the years, uh, I would think, except maybe for the digital banking licenses, every other new uh, new moves which have been made by regulators have actually come out of India. I'll give you one example on that. So uh, RBI was pretty much behind formation of NPCI. NPCI was still created mm -hmm. as a act of the parliament, but mm -hmm. RBI was the brainchild behind NPCI. When you look at the fintech opportunity around the world, most entrepreneurs have had to build the infrastructure, build the app layer, and then the, get the consumer adoption towards that fintech opportunity. In India, and we are one of the only countries in the world, 
the infra layer is almost being presented to the entrepreneur. So right now, what UPI has done is allowed money to move between two individuals, exactly how WhatsApp messages move, making it extremely simple. So we as an entrepreneur are only focused on the application and then working with the consumer about how mm. consumer behavior can change. And mm. that is just a very big push to the entire business. So that's one. Mm. The mm. second piece obviously is that um, with some of the moves that the government has done around GST, the whole uh, jam trinity, that mm. has impacted our business significantly in a positive way. Positive way. That is being reflected in the transactions. Uh, literally, you know, if I'm the CEO of NPC, I would be going off to bed every day knowing that tomorrow will be better than today because the mm. numbers are just rising. But mm. it's also rising on the card side. So what we are mm. getting to see from consumers is consumers are feeling a lot more comfortable in using their debit credit card to make payment transactions. I'm going to give you mm -hmm. one example, which I find uh, very, very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. We are, a, you know, I, I'm an angel investor in a startup. And by the way, Rajan is also an investor in that company. Uh, mm -hmm. And that company, what this, uh, you know, the company is called Pankuri. And what this person does is she brings in housewives about uh, at four o'clock in the evening, these housewives come together. They all communicate with each other. There is a teaching session which is held. And she almost ends up with about 1,000, 2,000 people who come in for these classes. And you could be charging 10 rupees, 11 rupees for per class. Just two years back, you wouldn't imagine to make a 11 rupee payment, join a mm. class impromptu, and mm. then you know communicate within the community. Uh, so this is sorry, I mean, this is what this is financial literacy. What are you, what are you teaching, or just anything? I'm, I'm, no, no, no. She's she's teaching everyday skills, right? Okay. In some okay. cases, it could be cooking. In okay. some cases, it could be okay. makeup Fine. or whatever. But what I'm trying to say out here is 10 rupees, 11 rupees transaction. Yes. 11 rupee transactions just using your UPI handle has become so easy. So mm. when CK Pallad used to talk about, you know, uh, uh, bottom money to at the bottom of the pyramid, I think that day has truly arrived. So one of mm. the things that we are going to get to see is we are not going to get to see entrepreneurs only addressing the top three, four, five percent of India. They are going to go to the next level and we are getting to see monetization happening in that area. One mm. last point, which I leave out here before uh, I give it back to you is we are also getting to see credit take off in a big way uh, mm. in the last two or three months. And we talked about some of the iPhones before, but in the mm. last two or three months, all high end phones, which was sold in India, almost 40% of those were sold on buy now, pay later wherein the consumer is taking a three, six, nine, 12 months uh, installment mm. loan for making mm. that purchase. And again, what is happening is credit is no more a taboo. Credit has started to flow to the Indian consumer. And I would want to think that we at the fintech world have played a little bit of a role to get that whole credit going. So in general, I think a, the regulator has been net very, very positive for the business. And then the second thing is both the business community and the merchant community have shown the will to adopt to digital technologies for their everyday transactions. So I'm just in 30 so seconds it, to be doing this. Here, thing. Under three minutes left. Yeah, yes, I, I'll, I'll do it at four o'clock with eyes. So I just, so why, what explains cash rise? Or you think just, just too much transactions? So it's like I, I have absolutely no understanding of the cash rise. What I can tell you very confidently is the same merchant 18 months before that percentage of digital transactions have gone up almost by 20%. So it was, mm. if it was 10%, it's now 30% in the same mm. offline merchant. Mm. Sure, sure, sure. No, no, thanks. Amish. I had two quick things, uh, Suresh with you and my other panelists, and then I'll hand it over to Raman is that, you know, two things to flatly mention, but one is that, you know, um, one of these hardwares that has been talked about in the economic sense is the huge pumping of money and into good things like, you know, 100% electricity, 100% tap water, uh, you know, and, and cash transfers and new, you know, Swachh Bharat and all that huge amounts of money have gone into pipeline through this. Presumably this has flown into the bottom of the pyramid and making, you know, base higher. 
Suresh, do you, I mean, is this, is there any impact on your business of this visible or is it hard to monitor? Um, and if there is any big thing you expect government to do in the next five, six months? Look, I think, uh, you know, there is definitely, uh, you know, uh, definitely the impact one is uh, seeing of this kind of expenditure, especially in uh, rural India. Mm. You know, rural mm. India for us, you know, for us as a company, uh, mm. while we were always seen to be an urban centric company, surprisingly, in the last couple of quarters, we have been growing very well in tier two, tier three, tier four, mm. and also rural India. Mm. There is, and I think one of the, the big reasons for that is what uh, Daisy talked about, the digital convergence of India that is taking place. Mm. You know, digital convergence, when it is met with accessibility and availability, mm. creates the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ground mm. for brands mm. to get penetrated. And that is something that uh, one is seeing quite aggressively. And mm. in fact, this whole digital behavior you know, of consumers getting digital, I mean, mm. the fact of the matter is that many of my brands during this period mm. has really survived on the strength of digital connect, mm. not physical connect. And, mm. uh, you know, while the world will get digital for sure, but mm. any company or any, you know, small or big, and I think a lot of it is also fueled by what uh, Rajan does uh, mm. in terms of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the funding of the tech startups. Mm. Is the whole digital facility and capability of this country is mm. going up dramatically. Mm. The question is, how do you translate that into a business model of sustainable growth? And not just a practice for, you know, entertaining yourself or, or, uh, or doing it. So I think this, this whole revolution, I would really call it the, the tech platform, the renewable mm. energy platform. I think that's a huge, huge opportunity uh, for the country. And most importantly, employment generation. I mean, the, the fact is, we can, if, if somebody, one famous man in the industry once said that only one fourth of the engineers in this country are employable, mm. unless we change the dial on that, mm. uh, I'm afraid all this will still remain, uh, uh, remain a pipe dream. Right, right, right. No, 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 absolutely, Suresh. Uh, thanks so much. Just like 10, 10 seconds ago, uh, 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 I was just coming to my other panelists. Said, is there anything with inside or outside of India that you think that the government should be doing and not doing? Uh, Rajan, if I can come to you, it could be anything. I mean, obviously, with the macro economy, uh, would you like the government to come up in the next three, four months? So I think, uh, Rohit, maybe I'll, I'll talk more about regulations that could impact or enable, accelerate the already the train that's already left the station on startups. First and foremost, I think much like what uh, Amrish said, right, the Indian government's been extremely forward looking when it comes to startups, right? Uh, uh, you know, many, many things, whether it's the infra public digital infrastructure that's built, like other UPI, now the account aggregator framework and so on. I mean, all of these things are massive accelerators. I'd say there are three things. I think first is uh, we've been talking about this for a while, which is, uh, you know, uh, Indian startups being able to list directly on international exchanges. Right. Exactly. right? I think this is a huge, huge unlock. Uh, I would argue the single biggest unlock over the next decade to for us to really be able to build massive global companies, right? Truly of global scope, scape, scape, mm -hmm. uh, scope and scale. So that's one. One. I think second look in many sectors, we should make sure that we uh, we don't uh, you, you know we go forward not backwards. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know I think uh, our regulators could 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 yes. want for various reasons. Yes. Uh, you know, get regulations maybe that don't move sectors forward. And I think mm. the third one is, uh, um, third one really is, you know, we want to make sure we win the future, right? Mm. So, so Web3, in many ways, everything we've talked about when it comes to the internet is really Web2 now, right? The mm. Web3 is here, right? Web3 uh, is here. And India has a unique opportunity to win Web3 period, mm. right? In many ways, we didn't win Web2. We, we leveraged on Web2. Uh, mm -hmm. And we built a bunch of very interesting companies in India, right? But we didn't win Web2 globally. Now, I think we are in this unique point in history where we can win Web3, period, right? Because we have the talent. And But you we can't win Web3 without the right regulatory framework. So I, I would say, uh, you, you know, we've got to make sure that we win the future. And, we, you know, the regulation enables things like Web3 at scale. Without it, you can't really build a... Like, for instance, today, by the way, Singapore in Asia has positioned itself as the hub for Web3, Web which, you know, which, you know, which is exciting because we invest across India and Southeast Asia. But but being here in India, I wish it was us because yes. we have yeah. engineering talent, right? Yeah, we have already passed four. 
Five. Yeah, then I'll, I'll give Daisy and even 30 seconds each because it's been unfair to them. To, if they have anything to say about anything they want government to do, Daisy. Just oh, sorry to Rohit, pass around, but. Yeah, Rohit, I'll just add that the government's making a number of interesting annou announcements, right? A programmatic right. announcement, policy announcements regularly, you know, whether it's Make in India, whether it's BLI, whether it's asset mon monetization, and so on. I think. The speed of execution and the clarity and the pragmatism with which we execute is mm. probably what is holding us back, right? So there's a there's a unfair an announcement, but how do we make it pragmatic to execute on the ground? And the speed and urgency with which we do that will ensure we continue to grow at that eight and a half, nine percent. Otherwise, we'll fall back to five, five and a half percent, which other countries would be celebrating, but it would be very muted for us and won't solve that yeah. employment problem we've all been talking about. Absolutely. No, no, no. Very true. Very, very true. Hi, Amri. Sorry, if you could just tell us something about one thing you wish the government to do. No, I, as, as I said, uh, we think that uh, we've got all the support. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity which is coming up when uh, the KYC becomes uh, common between various regulators and can be used interoperable. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we had the Niti Ayoga actually had us present to Modi ji uh, a few months back. Uh, right. And this was a clear ask from the fintech community. No, I think they are working well. I don't know how soon they will come out. We yeah. hear that they're working. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I know Suresh, all of you. Have to, I have to hand it over to Raman. Raman, sorry, we are just, we are just only two minutes off. That's the time uh, Suresh's company makes Maggie for us. So we are not. Uh, Word or two, but Raman, please, I hand it over to you. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter now. Uh, we have to now close it. A very quick thank you. So I won't summarize the key findings, which I wanted to very briefly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suresh, Rajan, uh, Daisy, Ambrish, and Rohit. Thank you very much for what was a fascinating uh, session today. Uh, more about individually, I will give my thoughts later to all of you as and when we meet. But thank you very much. Thank Thanks for the fantastic panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.